1. I was born in Delaware and lived there for a few years until my parents got divorced and I moved states with my mom. But I would still go back for some holidays and every summer to see my dad and his family. I was always really close with my grandma, so when I visited, I usually chose to stay at her house, which, at this time, was about 40 years old and my grandfather had built it in an area with a lot of trees and it backed up to the woods. Being that this house is in an out-of-the-way location and it would most likely stay within the family, my grandparents decided to have a family cemetery in the backyard. When my grandma's dad died, he got cremated, and his ashes were stored for eight years or so until my grandma's mother died. She was also cremated, so at their joint funeral their boxes were next to each other, under a tree with a shared gravestone. A year after the funeral took place, I was visiting my grandparents with my sister. Some other family members had come from out of town to stay there also, so both guest bedrooms were full and me and my sister shared the pull-out couch. Keep in mind that since this house is basically in the woods in a small town, there was no light and the living room was pitch black. There was a clock in this room as well and it chimed loudly when it came upon an hour, so sometimes during the night I was woken up by it. I open my eyes and a few inches from my face is another face. At first I just lay there still in shock and fear, because I was only like ten at this time, and I didn't know what else to do. I knew immediately, however, that the face was not that of a living person, because it was slightly transparent, and there was no breath or body heat. It was a young woman's face with dark hair, and she wore a concerned expression when looking at me. I knew she wasn't evil or anything, so I stayed still as she moved a hand up to my face. She tried to touch my cheek, but her fingertips went through. When she realized she couldn't touch me, her face became sad and started to disappear. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again, she was gone. I was still a little freaked out, so I turned towards my sister and pulled the covers over my head. In the morning, I asked my grandma what her mom looked like young because I had only seen her in her 80s, just before she died. She showed me a black and white photo of her parents when they were around 20 years old, and sure enough, the woman in the photo was who I'd seen the night before. I told my grandma and she cried, saying that her mom's music box, which is also in the living room, had been playing randomly on and off. The weird thing is that box had been broken and missing some of its parts for years, including its key so it couldn't be wound up. 2. Growing up in central Appalachia, I always heard ghost stories and about ghost sightings in the area. One that has stuck with me the most is the stories from several people I know describing the same spirit or entity in various locations and various time periods. The first time I was told of this spirit or entity was by my father. His story happened when he and my aunt were very young, probably around 1961 or 1962, when he was around five years old, and she was around ten or eleven. My grandmother and grandfather had a lot of property that included their house, and basically a whole mountainside. Their house was situated next to the road, and the hillside raised up on the opposite side of the road. There was a path leading up the hillside to a couple of flats my grandparents had made, with the first flat being about 150 feet from the house, and the other one a few hundred feet up. My dad told me that he and my aunt were playing on the first flat, when all of a sudden, they both looked up the hill at the same time. They saw a man wandering out of the hills. My dad described him as being dressed in a dark overcoat and with a black wide-brimmed hat. They couldn't see his face because he had his head down. The man was moving slowly toward them. But my dad described a feeling of absolute terror that swept over him and my aunt as the man got closer. They both got up in a panic and ran the hundred feet home. They frantically told my grandparents what happened, and my grandfather grabbed his gun and went out to see who it was. My dad and aunt swear that it couldn't have been more than a minute from the time they took off running until my grandfather was up the hill looking for this man. But by the time he got there, it was like the man had disappeared into thin air. The second time this spirit or entity was sighted, that I know of, was in the early 2000s, about a half mile from where my dad's experience happened. At the time, my stepdad was married to someone else, 
and she had an adult daughter that was engaged. It was Christmas Eve, and the daughter and her fiancé were getting ready to leave to go to the next place. They had both come back inside to say their goodbyes when my stepdad's ex-wife saw a man in a dark coat and wide-brimmed hat walking in the driveway when she glanced out the window. Again, when her and my stepdad went out to check, no one was there and there's no way someone could make it from their driveway to being out of sight so fast. The next day, the fiancé of the daughter was found dead. The last I have heard of anyone seeing this spirit or entity happened about five years ago. Maybe a mile from where my dad's experience occurred, a family friend was cutting weeds on a hill up to his property line. Past his property line is just woods, and there are no more houses on that particular hill and mountain. While he was cutting weeds, he noticed movement in the woods. When he looked, he saw the spirit, or entity, dressed just the same as when everyone else had sighted it. He said it turned and headed back up the hill very slowly. As soon as it realized he had seen it, he didn't stay long enough to see which direction it went in, because he was so creeped out. Not long after, as in a few days later, a huge cloudburst hit the area, and a few people died due to the flash flooding. Has anyone else ever seen something similar? It seems to be sighted right before something bad happens. 3. So I had something very strange happen to me last week, and I haven't been able to stop thinking of it since. I live with my boyfriend, but he was out of town on a trip with some friends, so it was just me and the animals for a few days. I always really feel uneasy when I'm home without him, and I've never really been able to explain why. The dog, who loves human attention, flat out refuses to go into the bedroom when he's not home. My cat sits on the back of the couch next to our bed and stares at the corner of the ceiling like she's watching something, but only when it's just she and I in the bedroom. Before this, I had never had anything unexplained happen, just felt generally icky, I guess. When I'm sleeping alone, I always sleep much lighter. Almost like I'm on edge or listening for something. It's not uncommon for me to sleep through tons of noise, a storm, my boyfriend moving around the room, etc. When he's home. But when he's not, my sleep takes a turn for the worse until he returns. I wake up in the middle of the night. Can't go back to sleep. Can't fall asleep in the first place. I just chalk this up to feeling much safer in general with him around. One of the nights he was gone, I fell asleep around 1am. My cat was in the bed with me and the dog was in the living room, because he refused to sleep at the foot of the bed, like he usually does, even after tons of me baiting him with attention and treats. Around 5am, I was awoken out of a sound sleep to a loud noise in the bathroom, which is attached to the bedroom. My spot in the bed is directly next to the bathroom door, which we usually keep open because the litter box is in there. I sat up, immediately thinking the cat had knocked something off the counter. She sometimes likes to sleep in the sink, weirdo. But I looked down and she was laying next to me in bed, ears alert, staring into the bathroom as well. Freaked out, I turned on the light and saw that my boyfriend's travel kit had fallen out of the closet onto the floor. He had used a different one for his trip, but left that one on the bed when he left so I had put it away two days earlier in a fairly secure spot. I'd imagine if it were going to fall out of its own accord, it wouldn't have taken over 48 hours to do so. I could be wrong, but where I put it, it would seem like some kind of force would have to act on it to cause it to completely fall out of the closet. I was so on edge it was difficult for me to go back to sleep for almost half an hour. Everywhere I have ever lived, my parents' house growing up, my college dorm, all four of my college apartments, my first apartment out of college, and now the one I live in with my boyfriend, I have experienced at least one, usually more, weird event that was difficult to explain away. Honestly, the travel bag must truly have just been in the process of falling for a couple days, but it just doesn't seem super likely. Thoughts? Does anyone think this could be paranormal and or something following me? 4. Okay, so I literally live 5 minutes from Dyer Lane. I have lived there for 17 years now, and I have been up and down that road all times of the day and night, walking, biking, or a car. One of my friends used to actually live on Castle Road, the road with the farms. 
In the entire 17 years I have lived here, I have had numerous paranormal experiences in my own home, infamously known for being haunted by a lot of people who have been to my house. With that being said, I had never experienced anything before at Dyer Lane, until April 20th, 2018. Yes, I was one of those people who would tell the spooky stories of Dyer Lane to anyone who had never heard of it, just to get a kick out of people being scared. To be fair, my older brother did it to me, so I just passed on the tradition in our town of the tale of Dyer Lane. I've done a lot of research on the paranormal or odd events that have happened around that road, and I have come across a few different findings. One back in the 1930s to 1940s, a group of KKK members used to have their meetings out on one of the farms out there, and may have, no actual recorded proof, hung a few people out there of various ages. Two, in the 1960s a group of high school girls formed an occult group that used to perform their rituals out in the cow fields. One source claims that one of the cult members lured her sister into the field and used her as a human sacrifice to summon a demon. Three, Numerous sites have actually reported UFO activity out in the fields. There are dozens of reports of a football-shaped object appearing in the sky and disappearing as well. That has actually been reported as recently as six months ago. Four, this one ties into the cult thing. But sources stated that a farmer was out in the field when he heard cult-like chanting. Somehow he fell off his tractor and managed to get run over by it. This one I'm not even 50% sure I believe it. It's just what I've found. With all those stories being said, I kind of grew up believing the tales of Dyer Lane was a bunch of baloney. However, what I'm about to state is the reason I am posting here. I had to tell someone. My friend, I'll call her A, had never heard the stories or seen Dyer Lane. So I figured, what the heck? I first took her down last week before 4.20. At around 2pm. It was a nice sunny day, and during the day the road is actually a very pretty sight. I parked my car at the first bend, and we got out to walk about halfway down the road and back. Nothing out of the ordinary happened then. A lot of car traffic, but that's nothing out of the ordinary. Skip a few days to Friday, 4-20-2018. So I'm getting stuff from my house to stay at A's house for the night, and it was about 9pm. For shits and giggles, I was like, Hey, wanna drive down Dyer Lane? You said you wanted to go at night. She happily agreed. Me living here so long and knowing Dyer Lane is literally within five miles of three high schools on a national stoner's holiday, was figuring there would be a ton of traffic on that road at night. I was wrong, it was dead. So I turned down from Watt Avenue to Dyer Lane. And it was pitch black, so I turned on my brights to see. When we first turned down the road, there was no one else there. About a quarter of the way down the road, we saw taillights ahead of us. The closer we got, the slower the car in front of us started going. Also, the closer we got to the car, it was a green SUV, kind of old. The hair on the backs of our necks started to stand up. We make it around the first bend, and the car is maybe going five miles per hour. You can see people in the car, but can't make out any features at all. The car starts to pull to the side of the road to let us pass, but everything inside of us is screaming not to pass the car. Also, I forgot to mention that I had my window down the whole time, and A had her window cracked but not down. We approach the second bend, and literally everything inside me is screaming not to follow the car anymore, since Casa Road is darker than Dyer Lane. So instead of following after the car that had already turned, and disappeared into the darkness. I started to turn around the bend. I just finished backing up and my window was almost facing Casa Road when an overwhelming feeling of someone approaching my car came over me, causing me to turn my head to look down the road at Casa Road when I saw a tall black figure running at my car. Not humanly running, if that makes sense. It was moving in a direct line, no footsteps really heard since I had the radio on but moving inhumanly fast. I instantly floored it back down the road towards the first bend, neither A or I saying a word right away. I noticed out of the corner of my eye that A hesitated in wanting to roll her window down, but rolled it back up. I then spoke up, did you feel that? She looked at me a bit pale. You mean the figure? 
I just kept my face forward as I turned back onto Dyer Lane. And the entire air around the road was dark and heavy. You could feel that something didn't want you there. I rolled my window up before I turned back on Dyer and tried to drive as fast as I could. We both felt something intensely breathing down our necks. I didn't tell A about the figure I saw. She told me about the feeling she had about a figure approaching the car. That's when I told her what I saw. I haven't been back to Dyer Lane since. Now, mentioning that I have been living in a haunted house, I have grown up a bit sensitive to paranormal things. It's not something that I asked for, but I have grown accustomed to it. The older I get, the more I notice and grow used to seeing. However, whatever I saw in Dyer is something I have never felt before. I haven't been able to get it out of my head. Same thing with another entity I have felt in Citrus Heights at a burned down house. Update. So I mentioned that my house is haunted. I do believe I have to clarify a bit. I'm more sure it's actually my family that is haunted more than I do believe the house is. Multiple people in my family, including myself, have reported being sensitive to paranormal events. My older brother, who I am very close to, is just like me about it. The point of this update is to inform you of my brother's Dyer Lane experience that caused him to never go back to Dyer Lane. Bear in mind my brother moved out before I did. He lived in there for 10 years and had been down the road hundreds of times just like I have. However, he has had in total three experiences of those times. But tonight he told me of the experience that happened the last time that scared him to the point he has never been back. My brother is 37 now and this happened to him when he was 22 years old. He and a couple of his friends, Ben, Brittany, and some girl I can't remember the name of, so I will call her Jane, decided to go down Dyer's Lane at 2am. I asked him what possessed them all to go down that road so late. He said, We were looking for a good time and horny as hell. So back then my brother drove a brand new S10 truck. This truck had no mechanical problems at the time, they drove down Dyer Road, hoping to pull off to the side and get lucky. They approached the first bend, and nothing was happening, so they thought, This road is a crock of shit. Just as they start to approach the first bend, the truck died, which didn't make sense. The lights were still working, but the truck wouldn't turn over. My brother and Ben got out of the truck, lit up a cigarette, and started to hang out outside the truck. They figured that the fuel needed to settle. They approached the first big tree on the bend, and they got about halfway around the tree when they saw the figures hanging from the tree. He said it was just a family of black figures hanging from ropes in a tree. They freaked out. Dropping their cigarettes, running back to the truck where it started on first turn, and they peeled out. Also, my brother asked me to describe the green SUV that I saw the night I went and he stated that he had seen that same SUV over 15 years ago in that road. We believe this SUV is tied into the road somehow. He stated he got the same feelings from it. The windows are broken out, and you can see figures in it. But you can't make out any features. The best thing we can say is if you see this car in Dire Lane, do not pass it. That's all I got for now. Thanks, guys. I thought this was too interesting to pass up on posting. My brother never spoke of his experience before to me, until after I mentioned Dyer Lane to him. He still refuses to go back to this day. 5. First things first, let me mention that this is one of many paranormal experiences I have experienced in my life. I have always been highly sensitive to what I believe are spirits in most cases and have a plethora of events I could discuss at length. This one, however, is one of the most memorable I've ever experienced, and incidentally, one of the scariest. I'm not particularly brave. I can't stomach scary movies at all, but somehow I always end up being too curious for my own good, and end up in scary situations. Go figure. With that said, on to the main event. Back in 2007, aged 19, I moved from my hometown to the nearest big metropolis to attend university. I had spent most of the previous summer working two jobs, including one at a medieval store, part of a bigger chain. We sold outfits, swords, jewellery, gargoyles, and all sorts of figurines and knickknacks. 
I had been a really good employee during my tenure, and when I told my manager I was moving and had to quit, he very kindly mentioned that one of the stores from the chain actually needed an employee right in the city I was moving to. Needless to say, I was pretty thrilled. He forwarded my CV to the manager in the other store, and she replied that she'd gladly take me on as soon as I moved. So summer goes by, I move to the big city, and in September I start working at the new location. First, let me describe the surroundings a bit. The store was located in the oldest part of town, and considering the city is 375 years old, those buildings have a lot of history. The street was long, narrow and cobbled, very busy in the summer, swarming with tourists. The store was on the bottom floor of a tall, very narrow building. The store's dimensions were like 16 feet wide for 65 feet deep, approximately, with 25 feet tall cathedral ceilings. The top floors were occupied by a busy bar and pub. There was only one door spilling out directly onto the street, flanked by a big display window where we'd put mannequins dressed in our wares. The very back of the store had another mannequin adorned display window. But no door since the street parallel to ours was actually 35 feet below. That part of town had been built on very sloped land, so every street going down to the river was lower than the other. This is pretty important to the story. Too long didn't read? There is one access to the store, and that's through the front door. The minute I stepped into the store, I felt something was off. It was stifling in there, like the air was heavy. I was immediately uneasy, but couldn't exactly spit on a job that actually paid well, where I knew what to do, and quite well, and that worked out with my student schedule. So I buried my concerns and got to work. I got along really well with my new co-workers, became good friends with the manager, the money was good, things were going swimmingly. But boy was I feeling on edge whenever I had to work or close up shop alone. The store was dark, long, and narrow, lined with gargoyles, mirrors, swords, and mannequins. To close, you had to go all the way in the back, in the storage room, flip off all the breakers, and then head back all the way to the front of the shop, in pitch darkness, to get out through the front door. Needless to say, I pretty much sprinted out of there as soon as the lights were off. Now, well and good. We could chalk all this uneasiness to the actual decor and architecture of the place, but not once did I feel any of that in my old store back in my hometown, and it had also been in the old part of town in a truly ancient building. Nothing tangible happened for a month or two. I was feeling weird and uneasy, but couldn't say with any kind of certitude that something actually was there. And then around late fall, around Halloween, I know, cliche as fuck, stuff started happening. I was opening the store one morning, and as I entered the shop, a massive gargoyle that had been on a shelf at least 16 feet up was in the middle of the floor, like it had been put there on purpose facing the door. And that was not a light gargoyle. Needless to say, I was a little unnerved. After that initial event, I would find stuff misplaced all the time. Things finding themselves in weird places, figurines in our bathroom, things on shelves switching places, hanging things crashing to the floor with no warning whatsoever. And then there were the steps. The floor of the store was very old, worn hardwood that was very creaky and unforgiving. The lightest weight on it would make it crack and creak in the most obvious way. And it would start cracking all the time, even if no one, no one visible anyway, was stepping on it. There are many instances of hearing steps when I was just standing behind the cash register, doing my thing. One night I was working with my manager, let's call her Jay, and I let it slip that weird things were happening. I was expecting her to laugh and reassure me I was making things up, but the face she made definitely let me know I wasn't the only one experiencing things. She spilled everything. She told me about things moving, furniture rattling, steps, things flying off shelves and feelings of deep uneasiness. The unsettling thing is that Jay is one of the least spirit-sensitive people I know. She lived in many haunted apartments without noticing a thing, including one aggressive poltergeist entity, but that's another story altogether. And even she was a little freaked out. So right there and then I had confirmation that at least some of my experiences weren't completely outlandish. 
I worked there through the winter, things had stabilized in some way, stuff was still happening, but I had started getting used to it, and would just be mildly annoyed when I'd come in in the morning and find things in odd places. By the time summer rolled around, however, things started escalating. Whatever was inhabiting the space had decided that moving things wasn't enough. It decided to start messing with us. Not just with me. The whole staff started experiencing things. Even my manager with the sensitivity of a teaspoon and the most skeptical of employees. An employee I'll name C came in one morning and as she was sweeping the floor by the changing cabins that were covered in large mirrors, swore she'd briefly seen a figure that definitely wasn't her in the reflection. When I got to work later that day, she was standing behind the cash register by the door and looked very shaken. She basically hadn't moved all day, too scared to get close to the mirrors, and honestly, I didn't really want to either. She told me how she'd brushed all the little things off, but that was definitely something she'd never experienced before, and she was really freaked out. Another employee, E, was definitely not the scaredy type, a big guy, very skeptical in his ways, and definitely scoffed at our concerns. Well, one night as he was closing with our other male employee, H, he felt a very cold, very solid hand between his shoulder blades pushing him. It was the most physical the entity ever got with one of us directly, aka actually touching one of us. I find it very interesting that it picked one of the most skeptical out of all of us to manifest like that. In any case, E was seriously freaked out. Try to explain it away, but of course, how the hell do you justify an ice-cold hand pushing you in the middle of a store with nothing near you? E was very tall too, towered over all of us by a head. Whatever touched him had to be tall too. H who was present and standing behind the cash register a good 12 feet away in front of E did not see anything touch him. H, incidentally, had one of the scariest experiences. It happened the summer before I started working. On a busy night, he was wrapping something for a client behind the cash register counter. On the wall behind the register, we hung swords. It was the most structurally sound wall, so it made sense to hang the heavier swords there. They were permanently locked in heavy, custom-made brackets with padlocks. You had to really want that sword for us to unlock it because it was a pain in the ass. For no reason whatsoever, one of the swords fell out of one of the brackets and it literally slashed his face. Out of nowhere. We kept those swords religiously locked. The odds of someone leaving a bracket open were slim to none. And even then, they were very heavy swords that needed some force to get out of the bracket. Poor H needed to get four stitches on his cheek. He was never the same after the accident, and was very affected by the vibe in the store. I think he was highly sensitive and definitely picked up on the negative energy in the store. He quit the following summer because he'd just become too scared of working on his own. Needless to say, I absolutely didn't want to work by myself either. The only one who seemed unaffected was M, the most skeptical out of the whole staff. M would literally burst out laughing and make fun of us when we spoke about things happening. It's an old building, things settle, the walls are soft, someone with a spare key is pulling a prank on y'all, etc. She was not believing anything and thought we were all collectively freaking ourselves out. I think her dismissal angered or bothered whatever was haunting our store, and it may have explained some of the escalation of events. The entity got more aggressive and started literally breaking things. We'd come to work to find things shattered, and stuff would hurtle off the walls and come crashing down beside us. We'd hear furniture rattle in the back store, and played rock, paper, scissors to find out who would have to go in there to turn off the light breakers in there at night. I was so terrified that when I closed, I pleaded with my boyfriend at the time to come get me so I wouldn't close on my own. I was once locked in there during my shift. I was rummaging for a box and the door slammed behind me. The key, which I'd sworn I'd brought with me, was nowhere to be found. Thank God my manager Jay was there with a the spare key to let me out. That also happened to her, and to E as well. We were all on edge, except M. Until one morning I got to work and M was already there. She'd gotten there early to chill and eat breakfast. But when I got there she was standing in the back of the store and was looking a little freaked out. 
I asked her what was up, and she told me that when she'd gotten in, there had been that heavy feeling to the store, like the place was crowded by bad energy. She tried shaking it off, but could not for the life of her feel good or truly alone. She'd felt watched and was not liking it one bit. I think the fact that she was actually physically feeling it was what freaked her out the most. And sadly for her, the feeling never really went away. She also quit in late summer. She was just feeling on edge every time she worked and not like herself, and literally told us that she felt that if she stayed, she'd go crazy. That definitely did not cheer us up. Our staff was up and leaving en masse. We were scared to work, saw things in mirrors, and even my notably spiritually insensitive manager was feeling like she was going a little insane. Things kept being weird and intense all summer and subsequent fall. Even clients picked up on the vibe. One woman refused to get in the store, claiming that there was something in the store that didn't want us there. That freaked me out so much. I felt cagey and on edge all day after that. I was jumpy, I had nightmares, I slept like hell. I was also in uni full time and working full time, I was exhausted and really over it. By the time winter rolled around again, I was ready to throw in the towel. Christmas came and went, and after that it got really dead in our part of town. I live in a very snowy and cold winter climate, and most of our clients were summer tourists. Business literally went dead after December until at least March, so I spent entire days alone at the store, with one or two clients in my entire shift. It was awful. I was waiting to land another job to quit, but then something happened that was the proverbial cherry on the cake. One fateful February day, I'd gone to work knowing full well that I probably wouldn't get a client that day. It was dark, grey, snowing and windy as fuck that day, full-on storm mode. I wondered why I even bothered showing up. It would have been smarter to close that day. But my manager was working with me and I decided I didn't want to leave her alone. So I get to the store. It's dark and gloomy in there. And my manager is already there, kind of throwing a fit. When she'd looked at herself in the mirror when she'd gotten there earlier, she felt like she wasn't looking at herself. It's hard to explain but she had the distinct feeling that it wasn't her in the mirror staring back. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but I ultimately understood what she meant. She kind of lost it and started yelling at whatever was there to leave us be and stop messing with us. It had basically just happened as I arrived, and for the rest of the day, we were both jumpy and on edge. Of course, there wasn't a single client. It was mid-afternoon, dark outside because the sun sets early in the winter, so dark indoors too. And it was just miserable. We were sitting in the middle of the store, where there was a decorative couch we actually used all the time, and lacing a big pile of bodices we'd gotten earlier that week, when we heard one of the tables in the back of the store rattling. When my manager went to check, she called me over. An entire display of little leather pouches that had been painstakingly arranged on the table had been tossed right off. Little pouches everywhere, the table was askew and long scratches had been gouged in the surface. Not deep by any means, but they were there. We were freaking the fuck out. That's when my manager noticed the mannequins in the back display window. They were facing inside the store, and not out as they should have been. She asked me if I'd moved them today, and I obviously hadn't. The only time we would actually move those was when we changed their clothes. No one could possibly have moved them, since the only door to the store was all the way at the opposite end. I then noticed that every single mannequin in the store was actually turned towards us, including the ones in the front display window. How or when that happened, I'll never know. I have no explanation to this day. If it was a prank, it was so well orchestrated, I wonder what kind of mastermind had this much time to waste scaring the fuck out of a little team of hapless teenagers and young adults just trying to get by. My hands are shaking as I type this. To this day, it's one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. Realizing that all the mannequins had been turned towards us, I still get major shivers whenever I tell people about this experience. 
I felt watched, and so unsafe it was horrifying. My body was in fight-or-flight mode, and I felt physically ill. I had to get out of there, and not a minute too soon. That's pretty much when I decided that it was enough. I pretty much told my manager, Okay, that's it. I've had enough. I'm leaving this place and never coming back. Fuck this. I'm going home. She didn't want to stick around either. So we grabbed all our shit and left right there and then. Didn't turn off the breakers, didn't do any closing procedure. We got our shit, put the key in the door, and hightailed it out of there. I never went back. The owners decided to close for the remainder of the winter the week after. We all got an unemployment benefits until we found new jobs. And when they opened again in April or something, I told my old supervisor when he called offering me a job that I'd rather literally die than set foot in the store again. I walk in front of the old building a few times a year, when my errands take me to the old part of town. They closed the store permanently a few years ago, and to this day it remains vacant. I ran into the barmaids and waiters that worked upstairs a few times. We'd often chat on our respective porches when we'd go out to smoke back when I worked there. Last summer I was walking on the street below the shop and ran into one of the barmaids. We started catching up and she was telling me how our old store was still vacant and that whoever visited it to open something in it would back out of it last minute or change their minds. I decided to bite the bullet and ask her if anything strange or uncanny ever happened in the bar, at the risk of looking a little strange. She looked at me with big eyes and nodded. At the time she said, chairs flying, bottles shattering, barmaids and waiters hearing sounds at night, doors closing of their own volition, and a plethora of others. We exchanged stories for a good hour. I'm quite convinced that the entire building is haunted. Would not be surprising in that part of town where most buildings are plus 200 years old. I never quite knew what it was that was there, what its motivations were, but one thing was sure, it definitely did not want us there. Let me mention that I am a scientist at heart. I would never label myself a skeptic by any means, but I do love a good logical scientific explanation. If I could have debunked any of the events mentioned, I would have gladly had. But there are no words, and not a single explanation I could possibly have for the horror, sense of dread, and events that unfolded when I worked there. And even now, nearly ten years later, you could never pay me enough to set foot back in there. Not in a million years. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 83. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Ah, you know, it's a lot more work, but I do enjoy it when I can make the paranormal videos a bit longer. Just something about a good, lengthy, spooky story. I couldn't help but thinking... Hang on, let me get comfy. I couldn't help but thinking during story number two there, I kept envisioning Kane. You know, uh, the villain from Poltergeist? Well, it's Poltergeist 2, I think, is where we first saw him. Uh, the way the guy was dressed with uh, the black hat and the jacket. Well, what was the name of that actor? I'm on IMDb at the moment. It's very exciting, the sounds of me searching the internet. Kane, 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 Julian Beck, there we go. Yeah, there's this very strong, gaunt appearance. I think he might actually have been sick at the time when he filmed it. Uh, which... Yeah. Yeah, he would have been. Uh, he passed away in 1985, uh, which would have been right by the time they were actually filming that. Came out the following year. Yep. So it kind of reminded me, I was picturing this, that, this wonderful scene in Poltergeist 2, where Kane, uh, Henry Kane, his name was, he's um, it's raining, and he's singing as he as he's walking along, and he gets up the the pathway to the house, and uh, Caroline's mother says, "Haven't I seen you before?" And he goes, "That is possible. I get around, love getting around, love talking to people, even on a rainy day." And I think that's the moment that made me fall in love with that character as a villain. And sadly, that was uh, the last time he appeared on film. Ah, well. And with that cheery note, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time...
Thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.